É, bom dia. Hello, good morning. I am Ari Plonsk. I am the director for the advanced studies of São Paulo. Um momentinho que está voltando, gente. Está tendo feedback aqui da tradução. Tem alguém com o microfone que deve fechar. Oscar Sala, uma parceria. This is a partnership between Oscar Sala Chair and CGI Brazil and its steering committee, Nick.br, which is being represented here today by Professor Eugenio Gucci, who is the academic director for Oscar Sala Chair. The reason why we are all together here today remotely and in presence is due to the international guest, Dr. Brita Partker. She is a node friend of advanced studies. We met each other while she was an executive director and the oldest institute which is related to the university in the city of Bielefeld, Germany. This is an interdisciplinary research center in Germany. And more recently, she is in the leadership of a institute which was recently created, not related to the university, but by the government of the province of Westphalia, Northern High Westphalia. She is an academy which has to do with international matters and which last year during the pandemic, they started their summer academy and in the second edition of the academy, we had the privilege to nominate a member of Oscar Sala Chair by the Institute representing the Institute and our chair due to the topic that was the topic of the seminar that is going to be the topic of this morning, which is the geopolitic of disinformation. And Magali Prado, she participate, I mean, she will participate at the event. And unfortunately, she will be remotely once that unfortunately she was committed by the virus geopolitics. And she couldn't make it today in presence, but very soon she'll be here sharing her experience. Our moderator will be Dr. Patricia Basilio from Oscar Sala Chair. And in addition to Dr. Magali, we have some other contributors some more collaboration that will be represented here by Patricia, Dr. Jose Renato, who is our moderator. Let me just make a comment that from this topic perspective, that is a topic that we are really fond of that we carry out in our institute for editions four editions of uh, scientific uh, diplomacy, scientific school and information diplomacy school. This is a course that counted on since the very beginning with a valuable model of FAPESP. The first year that was a presential, that was in presence, we had a total of uh, 900 young researchers, 40 members from abroad and 40 from Brazil with mentors that came from abroad. In 2021 and 2022, with several other sponsors where we have performed a virtual school and we are so glad to inform that uh, except if there are any changes that we can count on FAPESP 
support. So in 2023, the advanced school will take place in presence. Therefore, this international topic is a topic that we are very keen on. But from an academic perspective and from the advanced education of USP, it dialogues with advanced school. So Dr. Brita, thank you so much for being here with us. Your presence in Sao Paulo is so important. Thanks to Patricia, that will be our moderator, Magali, that was responsible to organize the events and all other collaborators, and also Professor Eugenio Buti, among some other liabilities at the university, he is the academic coordinator of our chair. Professor Eugenio, you have the floor. Bom dia, gente. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for your kind words. Professor Ari Plontis, who is director of advanced studies of our university. I would like to greet Brita Partner that has been already introduced by Professor Ari. And I have a very brief opening remarks as an academic coordinator of our chair, Oscar Sala. That is a chair, which is a consequence of a jointly effort between our advanced studies, CGI.br, which are two spheres, sister companies in the governance of internet in Brazil and a international governance uh, example for digital governance. I remember, and this is the reason why I'm here, to address the role of a great excellence carried out by the postdoc professor Magali Prado, who is also a professor. That she has been a type of organizing pillar for our chair, where we support and we carry out academic research that has been a support and a crucial presence in our chair activities. So the Summer Academy, when the Summer Academy of Geopolitics of Disinformation was developed in Bonn to address social media and international relations in Bonn in Germany, thanks to Professor Guilherme Ari Plonsky inspiration, we thought that Magali would be a crucial player and that she should be present. And this is a result of Magali Prado, who went to Bonn to participate at this seminar, this meeting and that will allow a balance of the situation with the Brita partner. So I'd like to thank you all. And I also would like to mention Daniel Schroeder, Sergio Barbosa, José Renato, who participates since the very beginning in Berlin. With that, I would like to thank you all for your presence and participation. And now I would like to hand over to Patricia, Bas Patricia Basilio, who will be our moderator here today. So congratulations, Magali, for all your efforts and great work. 
And thanks for being with us today, even though you have COVID. That is always, you know, so annoying. I know that we all get so desperate once we are caught by the virus. Now we are not so worried anymore, but yet uh, COVID uh, somewhat has to be watched out. Thanks, uh, Professor Ari Ponsky. And have a wonderful day. Thank you, Ari. Thank you, Eugenia. Brita. Brita Parner will summarize phases and open issues as how social media will impact international relations. And Magali Prado, remotely, she will address the artificial intelligence algorithms and fake news. Danielle Schroeder will address the dynamic of the conspiration theory in social media. Sergio Barbosa will address how WhatsApp sharing reasoning in small video pills were applied during Brazilian elections. Jose Pereira will address transparency in the AI systems throughout the social media as a tool to defeat disinformation. For those of you who are following us remotely, you may address your questions to our email and your questions will be asked to our speakers. And this is the address that you have to send your questions. Probably she has written that down over the chat for you to address your questions. So thank you so much, um, Aris, for the nice invitation and introduction, as well as Professor Bucci um, for um, receiving me so friendly here. I'm, I'm very, very um, uh, excited to be back here in, in Ah, I'm, I'm very excited to be back here uh, at the Instituto um, in Sao Paulo. I'm very happy here. And also my Brazilian colleagues uh, couldn't be with us here on site. Uh, I, I, I think it's, um, I'm very grateful that um, uh, Magali initiated this uh, follow-up discussion on the Summer Academy we had um, last August um, in Bonn in Germany. So Sergio, uh, Daniel and Jose, I'm, I'm so happy to see you again uh, at the different sites. I think um, Daniel is in, in Norway, back in Norway. Jose is in Berlin where I used to normally live. <laughs> and uh, Magali and Sergio, uh, you are both here in Sao Paulo, but not, uh, not on site, unfortunately. Um, so I, I, I was invited to give um, a short introduction in the Academy of International Affairs where I'm working for, as well as um, in the Summer Academy, the discussion we had in the Summer Academy. And Ari mentioned already that it might make sense to um, have a follow-up discussion here in Sao Paulo. Uh, you also mentioned that you have, uh, you are, have deep discussions and study studies on this very important issue of disinformation already. And I think international exchange is very important to compare our findings and uh, insights. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm very curious to uh, uh, see if there will be another following up somewhere. Um, but I'm, I'm very grateful that we have the occasion now to um, um, meeting us again uh, in a different um, framework. So um, may I get the power? I, I prepared some, some slides. Thank you, Georgia. So um, the Academy of International Affairs has been established last year in the building of the former Pakistani embassy in, in Bonn, the former capital of Germany uh, before the uh, reunification. It is fully funded by the land North Rhine-Westphalia. 
the idea to establish an academy for international politics, which is to be a place of work, a meeting place and a hub for experts from science, society and politics could not have been more timely. The last year has brought to our attention in a, dr a drastic way the developments that have been apparent for some time. The international state structure has become fragile. The globalization of economic relations has reached its limits and democratization in many states is on a decline. These changes can be felt not only on the grand stage of international politics, but also uh, in almost every area of our lives. Geostrategic considerations have gained importance for all sectors of social, political and economic life. In this new situation, um, um, of world politics, geostrategic analysis has become an important basis not only for foreign policy in a narrower sense, but also for all political and economic trade. In this time of great uncertainty, the, the Academy is self-confidently committed to openness, exchange and multi-perspectivity. We have set ourselves the goal that, uh, to create a place where new constellations and cross-border work emerge, thoughts and discussion takes place. This includes the involvement of a broad spectrum of disciplines, including the um, natural and technical sciences. But the Academy is not only an ivory power. Unlike conventional research um, colleges, the Academy is also characterized by a close interaction between academia and practice. Our fellows uh, come not only from the academic field, but also bring expertise from politics, diplomacy and civil society. We are convinced that actively shaping the upcoming transformation process requires close collaboration between thinkers and shapers. The Academy offers space and time to become familiar with the different perspectives, different mindsets, and to jointly develop a sense uh, of what is feasible with a view to the future. In the core of the Academy is a fellowship program to bring in international experts from different fields. Uh, but also workshops, events and open discussions um, are part of our activities. Uh, a flagship program is the yearly summer academy, which bring in a selected group of young researchers, but also young diplomats to spend uh, time together and discuss um, important pertinent um, topics with distinguished um, scholars. Uh, the first summer academy was about um, artificial intelligence and international politics, which takes place, uh, took place last year. Whoever becomes the leader in this sphere will become the ruler of the world, said um, Vladimir Putin once. This might be too uh, simple, but uh, it uh, indicates the growing competition for hardware, talents and data, uh, which has an increasing impact on international power structure. Just recently, the Biden administration placed um, a uh, strict limitation and extensive control of the export of microchips to China. These microchips are part of everyday products we consume, that is to say everything China makes, from cars to phones, washing machines, uh, toasters, etc. China's economy is heavily dependent on the import of those microchips, um, which are used in artificial intelligence or advanced weapon systems. The decision of the US American government is uh, described by critical observers as a new export uh, blockade, which is uh, unlike anything seen um, since the Cold War. International trading and uh, export politics have always been a powerful instrument in international affairs, but the new technology is becoming a crucial factor not only for the further development of the domestic uh, economies, but also geopolitical spheres of influence. The second um, um, 
summer academy took place, I mentioned that already, on the topic, the geopolitics of disinformation. It's related, of course, uh, obviously, to the first summer academy we have chosen. We could not have been more topical, as uh, it could be observed currently, in real time, how foreign disinformation campaigns could influence elections, political dynamics, and propaganda in war times. The Club of Rome recently called impending social collapse the greatest threat to humanities. It is fueled by growing inequality, uh, dwindling resources, and widespread disinformation campaigns. Propaganda, disinformation, and manipulation of the masses have always existed, but with the new media, the reach and the uh, multitude of actors and the depth of manipulation possibilities have grown enormously. Added to uh, this is a technological dynamics. Algorithm can track and channel the preferences of individuals in details, contributing to the creation of political attention bu bubbles, etc. The result is socially fractured society whose common reference to and comparison of reality is increasingly fading, in increasing loss of trust in science, jurisprudence, media and politics poses great challenges to democratic societies and uh, t um, lend tailwind to author, um, authoritarian movements. But also state actors conduct disinformation campaigns to the international stage of um, to um, destabilize other states and attack international relations. There is no doubt that the new techno technological possibilities have made disinformation campaigns a sharp rep weapon in international politics nowadays. In particular, the, the open um, discussion forum in democracy seem to be coming a gateway for target disinformation campaigns. In Germany, for example, it can be currently observed that more and more people are failing the Russian disinformation campaigns and conspiration myths about uh, the Ukraine war. What is um, uh, also very dangerous that the addressing of these campaigns are becoming increasingly difficult um, to identify. The Summer Academy, the geopolitics of disinformation, social media and international relations took place from um, 29th of August to uh, 1st of September and brought together 34 young researchers and diplomats from 19 countries to discuss this pertinent tof topic with distinguished researchers from polit uh, political science, computer science, economy, the art, and politicians. I want to give a brief uh, summary about the key talks and the broad spectrum of topics uh, which were discussed at the Summer Academy uh, before we take a closer look at specific aspects with the following contributions from Magali, Sergio, um, uh, Jose, and uh, Daniel. So, um, Sarah uh, Krebs from um, um, uh, um, Cornell, from, sorry, from Cornell University, explain how Russian disinformation campaigns amplify divisive social and political messages across the ideological spectrum, touching on controversial topics about race, immigration, and gun rights. Russia organized pro-Trump flash mobs in Florida and spent millions on a troll farm that set loose an army of propaganda bearing bots on social media platforms. Russia went uh, so far as to organize both sides of a protest as a mosque in Houston. The risk is not um, that the public believes disinformation, but that they do, uh, believe any, don't believe anything anymore. Alexandra um, um, Hera uh, Simenka from Oxford University focused on the sh um, shift focus from I ideology, uh, ideology uh, towards a focus on the increasing role of disruption, destabilization, and disorientation. I found it very interesting that he mentioned the language of Russian disinformation uh, campaigns is not English, but more Hindi, Tamil, Urdu, Zulu, etc. The Global South um, has become a new misinformation battlefield, and it's feeded uh, also by foreign, um, 
foreign state um, disinformation campaigns. And I also want to mention that the Russian, of course, not the only state uh, which are active in disinformation cap campaigns, but um, they found uh, also at the Oxford Institute that uh, I think the majority of, of states is active in um, using misinformation campaigns as a new tool in, um, in international relation. What makes it also difficult is a new development in developing um, uh, fake uh, deep fakes in video deep video fakes and audio fakes and I learned by Hao Li that the driving um, force uh, to what to develop these new te technological tools is the game industry uh, which is busy in creation of digital humans and they become uh, better and better uh, the new te technology is easy to access to a growing number of users and bring in, um, brings um, a kind of democratization of deepfakes. So uh, more and more people could use this uh, sophisticated tools to manipulate uh, videos, pictures, of course, and um, audios. Ha uh, Hao Li pointed out that increasing digitalization of communication makes us, us vulnerable um, as well. So, for example, how can I know that the real Megali is listening to us right now and will speak later? It could also be a, f uh, a fake, but of course, in this, um, um, I think, um, situation, we know that it's uh, the real Megali. Um, currently, we are experiencing a turning point. We have to prove that you are real, Magali. Artificial persons and fake become the new normal. Um, Anita Godes and Sergei Guriev pointed out that uh, the majority of political leaders use social media um, nowadays, uh, and um, in a good sense, but also in a malicious sense and that there is a blurring, uh, blurring line between democracies and uh, authoritarian regimes. So you can't just claim that the um, democratic societies are on the right side. We all see that uh, there are, um, in many countries, uh, we, we are experiencing also, also a new kind of dictatorship in a way, which is described by Sergei Guriev. These are not the dictators which, um, who rules by bloody um, terror, but they, they become more sophisticated in manipulating the uh, in surveillance society and every individual, um, so it uh, and establish a different form of totalitarian regimes. So there is a, a b um, blurring line between democracies and uh, um, authoritarian regimes, and this endangers um, the idea of democracy. Uh, Klaus de Frese from Amsterdam University um, um, pointed, um, draw our attention to the, uh, also to the danger of di uh, digitization of administration, which is also su susceptible to manipulation and creates the risk that faith in the rule of law will be shaken. Um, and public governance could be seen with, uh, as a new method uh, to surveil the masses. So um, all, uh, he also gave some examples how the trust in um, governments is um, er eroding. Um. And um, the last um, uh, talk was given by uh, Ayushman Kohl, and I found that very, very exciting to, uh, talk because he made clear that malicious disinformation campaigns are also driven by state actors. Um, Indian, the, and he gave him a very impressive example that the Indian ruling a party developed with support of a private company an app that can be used for disinformation campaigns to harass its critique, uh, critics and uh, journalists and to manipulate um, public um, perceptions um, at scale across major social media platform. I really could highly uh, suggest to uh, take a look at his talk which uh, could be found on our website. So um, there is uh, in the um, uh, media library, you find this talk and I think it give, uh, gives us a brilliant insight how dangerous uh, the new te technology become to establish, um, to, uh, yeah, to undermine um, democracy, uh, democratic uh, structures already. But he also gave an uh, insight how to combat uh, with this. He's very active in the non, um, government um, 
um, uh, organization. And I think this is what we really need urgently. I'm pretty sure that Jose given other examples later as well as um, Sergei. Um, so I, no, you see, uh, sorry, I forgot to um, show the slides. Finally, we had some um, pol um, key talks by politicians, by Alexandra Gese, uh, who is a member of the European Parliament and, and one of the driving force for pushing uh, the new Digital Service Act through, which was uh, just accepted by the, the European um, Parliament and is considered the first digital constitution for Europe. And uh, I found that really very exciting. Uh, and hope that uh, the, expect the high expectations towards the Digi Digital Service Act uh, becomes true. Here you see also Sergei on the picture. <laughs> and uh, Minister Roll, uh, the Minister for in um, Interiors of Northern Westphalia, made clear that cybercrime is a growing threat for uh, which uh, the German police are still far from being well prepared. A closer collaboration between state actors and private enterprises uh, should be urgent needed in his perspective. In addition to the key um, notes, workshops were held in the afternoons where participants had the opportunity to present their research and work. And I think those parts of the Summer Academy was even more important than the key talks. I just listed, listed here um, the very exciting um, interventions of the afternoon um, um, workshops and you could have a broad insight from um, how many countries we got an, um, um, uh, interventions and also the diversity of the topics um, from Brazil, from Romania, from Germany, from Israel, Ethiopia, etc. Um, so coming to my conclusion, I think it's crucial to better understand the interplay of psychological, social, economic and technolo uh, technological processes. Re research into the influence of social media on national, but also on international politics to find ways how to deal with these new phenomena and prepare ourselves, societies and democracies with, uh, without giving up the spirit of liberality and openness. Con comprehensive understanding must be based on interdisciplinary research and relies also on an inter intersectoral exchange between academia, society and poli politics. In particular, we have to understand the nature of the new technology um, and the business model that lies behind it to develop sophisticated strategies to educate um, social media users, to uncover disinformation campaigns and to adapt the law to stop malicious disinformation campaigns as early as possible on the web. However, most important is to strengthen the, tr uh, the trust in democracies that would need it action on the political side to extend participatory decision processes enable people to take over responsibility for their lives and communities and find um, enormous inequality in society. Institute for Advanced Study offer special opportunities for such interdisciplinary and intersectoral exchange because of their openness, institutional flexibility and their international networking. I'm very happy that Ari and Magali initiated um, to have a follow-up discussions of the Summer Academy here at the Instituto and look forward for inspiring discussions and possible spin out, um, out spin activities. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> vou reparar aqui um, vou reparar aqui um, um erro que eu cometi que eu não falei. I'm going to set straight a mistake that happened, and it's a huge mistake, so I must correct it. Britta is the academic coordinator of recently inauguration of the Academy of International Affairs in Bonn, and she is responsible for the fellowship program 
and the annual organization of the Summer Academy on International Policy from 208 to 220. She headed a center of interdisciplinary research hub and during the sabbatical period between 17 and 18 she traveled to study institutes in asia australia latin america the us and she headed the first systematic study of these institutes all over the world she has a background in bioanthropology and history she has a phd from the gothenburg university so now I invite Magali, Magali Prado, who's going to talk about AI algorithm and fake news. Magali is a professor at the PhD of Kojat PUC and from the Department of Information and Cultura from the PUC University. And She's part of the Institute of Advanced Studies at USP at the University of Sao Paulo. And she's part of C4 AI. She is a doctor in communication and semiotics and master in technology and digital design. And she's part of the work groups, journalism, law and freedom of IEA where she's a vice leader. Hello. I apologize, but I've got COVID. But I decided I would talk anyway. I hope you, you are not upset about my voice. I had found a clipping about the algorithms and because of the umbrella topic of the Oscar chair, which is the symbiosis of the algorithm. But I thought that speaking for over 10 minutes about algorithm would be a bit tedious. So I got a few clippings to make my talk more dynamic. And I hope it will be better than just talking. So I've spoken to Brita. It's a shame I'm not there. But I really enjoyed this overview that she gave us talking about everything that happened in the academia. And now myself and the colleagues will mention things that we debated there. And they were really very important for us to keep abreast of the state of the art in terms of disinformation in a number of places in the world. Very well. I've put together a presentation that will last slightly less than 15 minutes. So the idea of this league is to refer to AI algorithms and their limitations in fake news in the damages they cause in the political sphere, and sometimes this is automated. So I'm going to talk mostly about the political sphere. It's because we know that fake news conjured by human and non-human conjurers do not have the same speed as they did in the past. Now, with the internet, these platforms of social media driven by algorithms are much faster in mediating political debate in society. So it's escalated. So I'm going to present a premise that Brita talked about in terms of propaganda. Let's remember that propaganda, although uh, we have to think about the logics that is behind the dissemination of fake news, we must remember that um, ad agencies usually have an address. And this is the difference between fake news and the industry, or like Eugenio said, the super industry of disinformation. 
and then there's no way for us to find out who is behind these fake campaigns. And in the end, this is our greatest concern. Who is behind these campaigns? We know that fake news have always been around. Everybody talks about them. But since the times of usual propaganda and advertisement, we know that now everything has expanded in terms of volume and speed. So on social media platforms, AI algorithms are the basis of their business model. That is the mathematical intelligence of algorithms. We know that Google started it all and everybody follows Google. And soon after the internet bubble burst, they had to find a way to make income, to have revenue, and they did not want to charge for the search service. So this exchange happened. You give me your data, I will sell your data, and I will offer you the service for you to search for information. So disinformation comes from a Russian word. It is bor, disinformatsia. And it was coined during the Stalin era. There are different cultural understandings of what is considered legitimate and illegitimate persuasion. And disinformation, since it was operationalized in the US since 2016, uh, reflects a particular history. And I'm going to mention a few authors just to corroborate my talk. The issue of 2016 in the States, it's because that was when fake news became more widely known. In the past, it was uh, mentioned as lies or deceit, which is what fake news does. But this expression that I don't like very much, I prefer to talk about fake, uh, false or fraudulent messages. I do not want to use fake news. It's not news. News have journalistic and presets and investigation and checking. And uh, false, fake information is no better because information means something precise. So information is a rich word that must not be mixed up with fake messages. I prefer to talk about fake messages. Light ends up saying that PC are fundamentally machines algorithm algorithmic machines designed to store data apply mathematical procedures in a controlled way and offer new information as a result we know that what actually works is for you to provide an input of information and the output will be the results but these results are not necessarily trustworthy, accurate, many times they are untrue. Who really worked with the history of data was Edward Snowden when he revealed that the US spy our data. We suspected it, but were never sure. And Snowden, with his trained eyes, was the author of the greatest state secret leak in the history. Since in 2013, he revealed a worldwide surveillance program of CIA and the North American um, Secret Intelligence Agency. So with social media, it became easier with the internet first and then social media. This became much easier because you offer your personal data, your private data, not only address, social class or your university degree, but you add 
data about yourself, about your friends, about where you're going, how long you stay, where you click. And we end up providing information about our emotional status when we're not fine, when we are down, upset, or angry. And all of that makes up a profile, and this information goes into bubbles, and the people behind it can direct specific content to, for instance, a person who's undecided, a vulnerable person, so they will direct whatever they want, regardless of the content. So people are put in bubbles, and many times it's a micro-directioning to influence these people and, in this case, shape their thoughts and, therefore, their behavior. So, in this data pool called by José van Dijk, dataism, she says that if Snowden's leaked data has have taught us something. It's likely that institutions that collect big data are not organized separately from the agencies who, who has a political mandate to regulate them. So all three apparatus, uh, corporate, government, and the internet are really dedicated to uh, obtain irrestricted access to metadata. So we're not only providing our data, but particularly in WhatsApp, which is Sergio's topic, we also deliver our metadata. And how data is collected. So that somehow collaborates to design in a better way each one's profile to place them into bubbles, although we know that those, bu those bubbles, they keep changing. Today we are over here, tomorrow we are gonna change our minds, the different insights, and bubbles, they work somehow as a stewardship to guide us throughout the process. So data management is not simply information production, which is been done by mankind. Instead, datafication is a contemporary phenomenon which has to do with human life quantification throughout digital approaches based on economic value with social involvement and impact. Therefore, we are not simply addressing data. We had always shared our data during researches, ads, to whom we would vote for. We had always participated at different researches, sharing our opinions. However, today we are dealing on a much larger scale. Artificial intelligence services somehow they help to define and to establish some crucial scenarios to leverage geopolitical approach. Elizabeth addresses that, and many competitors they are really well known, such as the United States, China, and other countries such as Russia and India. They might be in this forefront as well. These are then those countries which are fully committed to be in this forefront. Magali, if you would allow me are you sharing a presentation? Because so far we just have your first page. We haven't been able to see anything. Yes, we are not. She's not sharing the presentation. She got stuck in the first page, just on the first page. Never mind. The PowerPoint is not relevant here because I'm just reading it. Do I still have time? Yes, you can keep keep going. Magali, you still have some time left. 
Yeah, probably I have shared my PDF instead of the PowerPoint. Então, é, o que eu tenho, estou com dificuldade também é, é de leitura desse PDF aqui. Deixa eu ver aqui a próxima. Acho que eu vou falar da, de cabeça, tá? Well, I think I will not follow my presentation. I'll talk just, you know, from the top of my head and I will summarize it. People share personal data, geolocation, where they are, where they are going to, how long they stay in each place. So they scratch all that information, perform a subsequently analysis to know what will people get. Not everyone, just those people who are more vulnerable without precise and accurate information. And not having information is also a sort of disinformation. So the reasoning behind the algorithms, they will define what that certain subject should get for how many times, what they should get and what they should not. All these definitions, they are not under our scope and we are no longer able to control a certain content which I would like to receive. With that, we are all in the algorithms uh, hands, we can no longer decide what to see, except if we go after information, information that we would like to get, to read and to perceive. But let's not forget that the great majority of the population do not search for what they are willing to get. They just consume whatever they have, they get. Back in 2010, Talenton addressed uh, platformization even before we started talking about platform to leverage platform throughout data or not to be defined as a, a platform of capitalism or economy platformization. This is a new terminology which complies with a platform policy. Today, everything summarizes into a platform, a content platform, technology platform. I mean, we are all living within different platforms. The most important platforms for the dissemination of this information, such as Google, Facebook, the main platforms I'm talking about, you know what I mean? They try to clean fake profiles. They do that, but not significantly. They should invest more time in that, but they don't do it because that's not of their own interest. But as they want to, you know, play the good guy's role, they remove fake profiles from the net. YouTube does that as well. Once YouTube YouTube shares extreme content. You don't know what I'm talking about. That right piece on the right of the screen, information content, they are giving you that because they want to keep you uh, it's, uh, in the platform. And similarly, they have to tell the society that they are helping to decrease this information. So now and then they remove uh, some sort of profiles or fake profiles. But uh, fake profiles, they get back. They get back with different names, with different profile uh, layout, and this information keep going on. So it's so hard uh, removing profiles. They try to do it, but not quite. Então, a gente também, é, eu fiz aqui que é importante a gente salientar que esses oligopólios da informação... Let's highlight that information, oligopolis, they were present even before the emergency of uh, platforms and even before internet was raised. Users don't care, they don't look at terms of use or conditions of use. 
especially because you know the types the, the the letters are so tiny no one you know bothers to read whatever they say under the terms of conditions and if you are not participating at the networks you are ruled out we who work with communication we test we are present at all networks because we work with that and we want to know how they work but there are people who do not get that information and they were not noticed. I will skip some slides, which unfortunately we cannot follow because she's not sharing. It was amazing to visit the Summer Academy because I could learn more about this information. But uh, more than that, I had a chance to be introduced to different colleagues, different researchers, each one of them adding some sort of solution from a regulatory perspective, some time of punishment for fake news or improving blockchain platforms to try to add some additional content that can be safeguarded or some, uh, or some sort of mediatic information including childhood, adolescence, uh, especially in the game world where they don't have much information shared. People, they have a different sort of solutions, but none of them really conclusive. And at the Summer Academy, we had the chance to be introduced to some tools that can defeat and deceive the fake news. We, while in Germany, we had a chance to learn more about deep fake. Deep fake not only deal with video and audio, audio is widely disseminated throughout WhatsApp channel, especially for those less privileged socioeconomic class users. There is no need to write anything down because people just say. So audios, they are widely spread all over. And we have uh, audio deepfake information, audio which is manipulated, synthesized. They remix and they cut pieces and bits of the person's voices. We have the anti-checking agency, surveillance agency for fake news. I would never, I never thought about something like that. And I have been researching for more than five years. There is a fake surveillance agency and they're gonna say that somewhat is true, even though that's not quite the case and they help to unmask face fake news. They are not present at all bubbles. They won't reach everyone who got the fake news and they won't get where they really should get to. But there will be a time that that will be helpful. It requires hard work, but it's too much. While we have a fake uh, information, there are several others that became uh, disinformation and fake news. The surveillance agency does a good job, but it does not work. Do I still have time or do I have to wrap up? I think I have uh, exceeded my time. Yes, if you could close we would appreciate. Yes, I apologize because I got so mistaken here with my screens. I didn't manage to share my presentation, but anyhow, I hope that you were able to follow my thoughts. I am researching right now robots, bots, and at what extent can 
be a disadvantage or an, adv an advantage if they speed up mass dissemination or not. So I am more into AI currently. AI supported by robotics. If uh, you have any additional information about the bots, please share those with me. And that's it for now. Thank you. Thanks, Magali. Thanks for your efforts. I know that you are not feeling very well. And as a journalist, I identified myself so much to your talk and that fake news should be called fake messages instead. That makes sense. From now on, I will apply that terminology. Thanks. Next, we have Jose Renato Pereira, who will talk about systems uh, transparency in social media and how can we deceive uh, this information. Let me read his CV. Jose Renato. José Renato, he is a researcher and an activist. So he works in systems, regulatory affairs, artificial intelligence, and he's the German fellow for the Alexander von Hurlbut Institute. He was a guest and observer visitor at the European Parliament, and he's one of the collaborators for public policies and the internet. He's got a master's degree by the University of Brasilia, and he got an exchange course with the Bologna University in Italy, and he's got a dissertation regarding machine learning systems transparency. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Patricia, for your kind uh, introduction words. Can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. First of all, it's a great uh, honor to be here. Thanks to it, it was a uh, it was wonderful to meet uh, Magali while in the Summer Academy as well as Sergio and Daniel. It's nice to see you all back again, and I also like to thank the AI team to make that a reality. So I'm here to talk about artificial intelligence with a main focus on mar machine learning in the transparency of the system. Machine learning is widely used on online platforms, enhancing searching tools in social media platforms and how to customize the content. The content personalization will define what to be seen in our timeline or what will be recommended during our experience at the platforms and that will encompass not only Facebook and Instagram, but also YouTube, all social medias, anything which will rank and establish the type of content to be accessed. This is a topic which I am into right now. And as Patricia said, I'm working on machine learning transparency system from an abstract manner and I would like to better understand the regulatory framework, norms and standards, and how can we apply that in an environment like that. I became interested in this topic based on the assessment of a system transparency where content is customized or where norms and standards are established by the recommended system. They show that several systems, they are helping to amplify reach of disinformation content or also 
any deleterious content uh, such as hate uh, uh, speech or any content that might influence people to develop uh, eat disorders as we can strongly see that uh, since the Facebook files were released and if I'm not wrong, last year, that became a fact. And with all of that, I would like to highlight two recent trials. One of them carried out by the University of Minas Gerais, addressing and analyzing right-wing YouTube channels, addressing hate, violence, and discrimination. And also Facebook executives, once they acknowledge that data management, personal data management, was taken to perpetuate a right-wing echo chamber. Despite a number of uh, mentions to the problems that those systems were adding to. Conversely, we had some restraints in the past years from a platform perspective. In Brazil, we had a number of criticisms as part of the process established by the federal prosecutor had established with the platform since the first half of the year. And they were seen as not sufficient any time we compare the sort of involvement and engagement that platforms had established with the federal, with the, with the Brazilian federal level and the US. In addition to that, Net Lago, which is a research center at the University of Minas Gerais, they announced that uh, a great percentage of those claims, once they were issued to the platforms, just 50% of them would become active. All content reported by users has been disinformation. They were kept uh, in, active in the platform, and that shows that uh, there is insufficient actions by the platforms to keep their environment healthier and clean. Additionally, it's also important to mention that Facebook files that were revealed by Huggins in the US showed a certain indifference on the part of Facebook. And although they were taken into consideration, but there was a preference not to deal with them, uh, these documents showed how Facebook knew about what was happening in the platforms, but didn't take the necessary action to address them in time. And an example of that was that when noticing that their content were leading adolescents, particularly uh, girls, to develop eating disorders owing to these disinformation that led them to think that these, these were the more toxic content that were being amplified, they decided not to change the way their system worked because this, of course, would affect their corporate decisions to grow the base so this was a sign, a strong sign, that these uh, systems were not altered because of corporate decisions towards amplifying the capital of the company. And this has to do with reports that these platforms continue grossing funds with this toxic content or disinformation content. And recently in the October elections, 
we saw that even sites such as Brazil Paralelo, which is a strong uh, portal where lots of unchecked information is shown as if they were true. So these portals, although there are sentences against these websites, these websites continued operating and obviously the platforms continued profiting from these ads. Oh, despite this historic, this history of disinformation. In this respect, it's important for us to recognize that these algorith algorithm systems are key in disinformation, and it's interesting to assess how this impact happens when we look and see that 64% of Brazilians search for information on the internet, on these medias. These systems are also strongly based on the processing of personal data or profiles. However, despite all of this impact that we can perceive on the systems, their workings is still very opaque, very little is known about them, and these platforms through lobbying and a number of activities, they have tried to distance themselves or to really um, make it difficult for people to understand how they work. Bearing this in mind, when we talk about transparency, the necessary transparency, for us to understand these systems, how they work, a number of issues come up and they are key for us to really understand their social impact and based on that to take initiatives to address these impacts. So issues such as which data is being treated to create this user profiles, and determine what information will actually affect this individual and create more engagement through anger, grief, or joy, like Magali said. Do they allow the platform to identify sens sensitive data, for instance, your religious inclination or the political party you're affiliated to or your health history, your health uh, records? what disease you might have had. And this might potentially be understood as a violation of the Data Protection Act. On the other hand, why do algorithms are expanding more radical and conspiratory content? And this has to, has to do with the business models adopted by these companies, because these systems are based on deliberate choices by the companies that many times reflect their commercial economic interests rather than an interest to create a more a healthier environment for society to have a democratic discussion. Despite all that, there are huge challenges for us to have access to this information. And relevant enough for us to understand their impact. On the one hand, there is the possibility of uh, an avalanche of information regarding the user, the auditor, the researcher, since there is the possibility that if too much information is provided, it creates what authors call intentional opacity. That would be strategic, strategic opacity, which is an initiative whereby 
an entity provides a massive volume of information so that number of elements that are relevant become opaque because it's impossible to go through a massive amount of information with the same level of attention. And many algorithms work and are tested at the same time. So these are the A-B tests and these platforms, for example, they send me a sort of, of content or I have access to specific algorithm that other people will not have access to because they test these algorithms to see what creates more engagement among users. Additionally, a third challenge is the fact that the recipients for each kind of each piece of information are different, have different expertise levels and different objectives in when they access this information. So a user, a platform user who would like to understand why they've received an ad that leads them to uh, terrorism content or Nazi content, this person has a certain expertise and objective with that information, which potentially is different from that of a regulator or a civil society organization has. So there's also this challenge that we must bring information so that it is relevant and easily understood by the end user. And obviously different platforms have different features and the workings of a Facebook system is different from what happens at TikTok or YouTube. So this must also be taken into consideration when we think about regulation. And this is why it's key that when we think about providing information through platforms, we must bear in mind who accesses the information, what they expect, what their objectives are, and how this information will be announced. And this is, uh, here I use a quote by Pasquale, he says, when we want to understand the system, it's key for us to have access to selected revelations so that we respect all the interests involved. So as potential initiatives, what can we think up? Various of the groups that have debated this have talked about the importance of having access to data for researchers on what happens on these platforms. We've got a number of examples that detecting social problems that are detected by AI are done not necessarily by regulators, but by independent entities. It's the case, for instance, of the system in the US being used by a number of different courts to determine the relapse rate of certain inmates and the, the likelihood that they would have access to sentence benefits, so a reduction in their sentence time, etc. And these independent researchers identify that these systems were based on biased and racist data. And they did that owing to the fact that these applications provided a lot more benefits to whites than to blacks. Even the, the black, the white people Although the, the white people had had a higher relapse rate than the black population. So this is one of the aspects. Another one has to do with audits and inspections and also the explanation to users. So just to mention a few of the regulations in Brazil, we have the Bill 2630 that has uh, discussed that, but from the point of view of transparency to uh, draw up reports. We also have specific 
uh, devices that deal with explanation to users and regulators. On the other hand, the Digital Service Act in the European Union talks about a number of elements, auditing access of data to uh, researchers and risk reports and obligation to inform regulators about significant changes to the systems. And a very interesting example in China where they came up with a regulation that determines that specific companies that use customization of content should send explanations to a government-managed database about how their platforms work. And this opens up space for them to require more information and audit these systems. And now I move into the conclusions. Any piece of information must be provided, if necessary, significant and sufficient in a specific case to show whether data controller, and in this case, the platforms, is complying with the law or not when they're using machine learning. And to wrap up, well, transparency is not a panacea. We need it. So elements such as control over the timeline to determine what kind of algorithm a person will have access. And this is an obligation that is in the um, ethical code. And this is an element that might support us in this fight, this toxic environment on social medias and platforms as a whole. Control over personal data, that is what data being treated on the platform and how do they determine the content to be accessed. And also, Liter digital literacy measures and more data on the parts of platforms. That is the reach of their content, the reach of their ads, and the reach of the content identified as disinformation, the amount of people who had access to that. So all of that is extremely important for us to achieve this ideal of transparency on these online systems and so that we can better understand the corporate decisions and what they intend with each of these systems and what are the discriminatory biases that exist in these environments. That is, are uh, there possible conclusions about the social impacts of this system? So I'm sorry, I, I used more time and I'm sorry, but I'll have to participate in another meeting, so I'll have to leave this forum, and I hope to keep in contact with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose Renato. Thank you. Very well. You can send your questions at earesponde.com.br. Researchers will answer you at the meeting or via email. So now I'd like to invite Daniel Schroeder, who is going to talk about the dynamics of the theory of conspiracy in social media. Daniel, Daniel did P PhD at Simuli Research level. He is an associate researcher at Oslo Metropolitan University, and he is an associate researcher of the Technical University of Berlin. He has experience in the development of complex IT systems distributed. He has worked on analysis of social networks, and he aims to develop more universal methodologies to understand what happens with dis the dissemination of disinformation. In addition, he has been involved in projects to investigate the impact of disinformation in crisis regions in Mali and Ethiopia, and projections aimed at improve the graphic methods 
to study the dissemination of disinformation in large scale. Do you see my slides? So that's working? Yes. Okay, perfect. And the switching also. Perfect. Um, so today I'm going to talk about what I talked about at the um, Summer Academy for International Affairs. And it's just like a little bit of a broad overview about some of the recent work we have done. I think um, I did not include the result slides, but at the very end, I will talk a little bit about what we found out and um, give a little bit of a future work. So today I'm going to talk about um, conspiracy theory dynamics on online social networks. And that's work I've done together with um, Johannes Langhut, who was also my PhD supervisor here at Similar Research Laboratory, and Petro Lind from the Oslo Metropolitan University. And in fact, there was also a master's student involved, Kaspara Gaswoff, and she, um, yeah, she, she was very much implementing um, most of that stuff, but that was actually after this presentation, uh, or after I prepared this presentation. So um, this is why I give a little bit of, a, of an outlook section afterwards. So. Um, we very much looked into into a special kind of conspiracy theory, and this was the or these are conspiracy theories we call digital wildfires, and it's basically a conspiracy theory that ends up in real world consequences. So there's a lot of stuff out there, but some of that is just like so um, so inflammable, so to speak. Right, um, that people actually go out and take take action in the real world. And the first thing to to understand is that these conspiracy theories, especially those with um, um, real world consequences, have a kind of life cycle. So what usually happens is that somebody like a no name somewhere in the outskirts of a social network is actually tweeting or posting something. And for a long time, nothing happens. And this kind of like narrative is evolving and circulating in the outskirts of these social networks, right? Until suddenly it meets the right like kind of like influential person. And this person is kind of like amplifying the narrative while changing it. And this is actually what leads to this outbreak that kind of like ends up in this exponential function. I will come later to that that actually leads to this real world consequences. So it's basically um, a viral event. And what we did is um, in the past, we looked very much into one particular digital wildfire, which we were able to obtain the entire data from, and it was these conspiracy theories about 5G and COVID-19. So there are obviously people out there that claim there's a causal relationship we don't know no, this is like several sub narratives, but there's a causal relationship in between this 5G radiation or 5G radiation from 5G towers, this mobile communication network, and um, COVID 19. So it's like several different sub narratives. So some people claim they are like microbots um, that are just injected, and the government is basically claiming there is um, COVID-19 in order to inject us as microbots and to remote control us with a 5G network. So some people claim there's a cover-up. So as 5G was rolled out and it actually lead to this COVID-like disease. And the government is just now trying to cover it up and came up with that COVID idea. And besides that, there are like several different sub-narratives as well. Um, one comment on that is that actually it seems like that contradicting narratives are actually contributing to the dynamics and spread of the conspiracy theory. So out there in this conspiracy theorist circle, it's, it's just like this, this kind of like threshold what truth is, right? It's so dynamic that even contradicting narratives are actually contributing. So conspiracy theories have a, have a, have a life cycle. And what we would like to do is, um, we would like to predict when, um, when when conspiracy theories just reach that point where they become dangerous, right? So there's a lot of those out there and they can circulate and maybe they have a potential for danger, but we would like to to, to see when such a phenomenon becomes becomes actually dangerous. So we would 
very much predict the point in time when things go viral or exponential. So that's our whole motivation. And uh, coming back to this 5G conspiracy theory, so this out, like this narrative that kind of like circulated in the outskirts. It's like for the first tweet we had was China is 5G now and working towards 6G wireless radiation. It's an immune suppressor coincidence, right? So this circulated a little bit and the narrative changed, right? And this point when things became viral was actually when David Icke, David Icke is a um, British conspiracy theorist that published more than or published more than 20 books and sold more than 20 million million um, samples of them, right? Just like jumped on the train. And it's like a couple of other YouTubers that did so as well. And this actually like led to this, this exponential growth in people who were participating in this conspiracy theory. So we would like to predict when this is going to happen. The problem is that when we look into only content, right? Content is actually very difficult to monitor, very difficult to understand. We have tweets, right? And especially we have tweets or, or Facebook messages that are very, very short and they're not contextualized right so when i write something to my brother that might be picked up by one of these um, natural language processing algorithms and just like classified as as, um, as as dangerous content but in the context of me speaking to my brother that would be very very different right so modeling the context for these natural language processing methods is, is pretty pretty difficult and they have difficulties with um, catching things like irony and so kind of like, like being being sarcastic these kind of things right so what we want is we want very much to look into the into the structure of the spreading itself right and see whether there are um, whether there are patterns things that, that that always happens that are very much characteristic to the spread of these conspiracy theories and based on that would very much like to 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 identify um malicious content so that's that's the overall goal so what we do for that is we um we look into um social networks like we look into into physical systems right so there's a long history of things called social physics which you just consider a society as a as a basically a set of particles that somehow interact with each other and they are connected through these edges in, in, in social network right so this is not an Euclidean space in which each particle can um, communicate or interact with its neighbors but it's basically a network that somehow lives in in, in, in some weird space some, sometimes you find embeddings for that right um but but the idea is basically to to um, see society as something like, like as a new entity, right? So it's not just the sum, the set of all the individuals that are part of society, but it's a new entity with new statistical laws. So that's the idea behind the social physics things. Mm. So what we did then is we first of all collected a bunch of, um, of of twitter data i built a system that allowed us to um, scrape twitter data out of like entire twitter spheres so we collected all germany or all scandinavia but also several billion tweets about um, COVID 19 and what we did is because twitter follower networks are kind of hard to get at least in the size we built this interaction network right and and the action networks are basically based on contact. So we build an edge in between two individuals as soon as they met each other on, on, on Twitter in this case, right? And this could either be a retweet, you could have a comment on the same tweet. So there are things like quoted tweets, which are basically retweets you can comment on and things like that, right? And because these interactions, these retweets or comments have, um, have, have a timestamp, right? And there is uh, this is actually a number of times I have retweeted somebody. We can define a distance, right? So people that retweet have like a lot of contacts are very close in these networks. 
and people that have not so many contacts or no contacts have either no edge or are just like very far this very far away from this network so we played a little bit around so when you look into my publications played a little bit around with these distance functions and ended up in one that kind of like takes the um takes the number of overall contacts and just like weights it by the re, by the average reaction time, I guess. And what we did is like some normalization, right? So that people who actually um, don't talk a lot at all, right? But talk relatively a lot to its neighbors. It's just like emphasize this, um, this, this edges as well. Um, so like I said, right, so the concept of, of, of social distance, people will talk a lot to each other and talk very fast to each other, very close to each other in these networks, and people will actually talk very um, very slow to each other and not so frequent are very far away from each other. And what we can do then is we can build the interaction network of entire Twitter spheres, right? And this is very interesting in... Um, in itself right because it's a weighted network and here we can already start to define regions that are maybe suspicious right so we could first of all look into community detection identify communities that are very very uh, malicious or like in the outskirts of networks we can look into centralities identify users that are very important or look into very central users in particular communities to see which accounts are actually leading the discussion in a particular in a particular bubble, so to speak, right? We can identify these filter bubbles. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of tools you have in, in this complex network size you can throw on this interaction networks in itself. Um, yeah, so like user activity, the impact, the influencing and influenced neighborhood of a specific node, right? Um, the diversity of a neighborhood. So you could assume that um, people who live in bubbles may have not such a diverse neighborhood as people who um, don't live in bubbles, right? And so that live in bubbles may be more prone to, to fake news or misinformation, disinformation, however you call it, because they don't have so much influence. They're just repeating the stuff that... Um, and peers in their bubble, right? You can look into neighborhood sizes, all these kind of like tools, things we know from complex networks. And um, yeah, so this is what I just said. We can look into that, uh, the topological and dynamical features and investigate which ones are more prone to the spread of misinformation and fake news. And what we can also do, and this is basically the main idea, right? Because all these interactions, like I said before, right, these tweets have timestamps. So all these interactions um, allow us to basically cut this graph. It's a temporal graph, right? Cut it into time slices and investigate the topological and dynamical features of social network change in time, right? So what we did for the COVID-19 data set is we just look into, into weekly time periods right so there's some dynamical system tricks so you can just like cut um, bigger slices and times where not so many things are happening just like take and take a different more yeah like a better resolution as soon as you as you work against like event horizon or something like that but we first of all went just like with weekly time slices and what you can do then and this is basically the main idea you can um use um, graph clustering, right? So there are these Louvain Leiden methods. So it's like modularity based um, graph clustering. I don't know if you guys are probably familiar with that. And you can see how communities basically evolve in each of these time steps, right? So in each week in, in our 5G example. And then you can, can start to extract physical behaviors right so is there like synchronization process right when you consider the temporal network of such a digital wildfire do we start with several different and, and this is maybe important to say right so the, the temporal interpretation of uh 
of one of these clusters or one of these communities, not just a set of people, but it's a discourse of a particular set of people that happened in time and speak about a certain topic when you do it properly, right? So when you consider these time slices, can you see a kind of like synchronization process where you actually have like several different discourses led by different influencers, for example, that's kind of like synchronized and split up again into different bubbles, right? So you're somehow in this in this world where you have this kind of like landscape, almost like a like a weather card or something like that with cloud that kind of like merge and evolve in time, right? And the idea is can you can you infer physical proof? from that and are there maybe things that allow us for modeling this, this kind of like digital wildfires or something like a phase transition for example right something like um, when water changes his um, state from um, from fluent to to um, that to solid to to ice something like that right so what we did is like our preliminary results are we want to identify areas in interaction networks that are of interest for the future, both in space and time. The dynamics of communication underlying digital wildfires show similarities to, to these phase transitions, right? And this is basically why I end my talk. Uh, influencer transition is sufficient to propose a possible driver, namely influential users. So what we figured out is that when you look into these clusters that Obviously, influencers are important, but influencers are not just important for the overall phenomenon, but for each of this bubble, right? So they are very much driving the, um, so it's a phase transition that actually lead to this, this digital wildfires. And that's a black hole transition, right? We observe critical size at which a cluster start consuming all other vertices. So there's this kind of like synchronization that splits up after the event horizon. Okay, and I think this was what I brought today. And yeah, thank you for your attention. And are there any, I don't know, do we do questions now? Or? Thank you, Daniel. Uma pesquisa tão visual. Não sei o que achei mais legal ouvir ou ver. Maravilhoso. Wow, wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you. Next, Sergio Barbosa who will address the reasoning of WhatsApp sharing in a vi uh, video pills format. Sergio, he is a scholarship uh, and he addresses Brazilian elections, the disinformation era when proliferating short videos on public WhatsApp. He was a scholarship at the University of Portugal, a scholarship found, financed by the Tokyo Foundation Policy Research. He is a former visitor researcher at the Internet Advanced Studies in the University of Manchester, in the UK, also in the Glasgow University, University, Amsterdam University. He's affiliated at the Information Center by the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, US. His researches explores emergent uh, uh, policies and uh, amazing possibilities that uh, spontaneous messages may send throughout uh, social interaction, throughout uh, WhatsApp groups. You are mostly welcome, Sergio. Thanks for the introduction. Are you able to see my slides? They are in English, but he will speak Portuguese. So, Britta, you benefit from the presentation in English, although you have to cope with the simultaneous translation as he will speak Portuguese. Let's try to save some time for the Q&A right after my talk. I would like to thank Magali Prado for the kind invitation and to bring together this event in presence. Unfortunately, I couldn't make because I am also affected by COVID, but here I am remotely. I also like to thank Professor Bucci 
for welcoming all of us. I had a chance to be part of a forum that would took place back in 2012. 10 years has gone by and much have I learned while a student, I got so inspired by Professor Butch's talk and that became a essay and a trial on geopolitics in my study. I also would like to thank the USP organizing committee and Brita. I'm so sorry for not being closer to you. Brita came all the way from Germany and she's alone in the Institute. Neither me nor Magaline are present. But anyhow, let's keep going. Today, I will address a more advanced uh, presentation, different from the one that I presented back in Bonn. While there, I was invited to perform a WhatsApp message group essay. And here I am to go deep into details and to address furthermore the topic that I addressed while in Bonn. 2022 Brazilian elections, the disinformation era when proliferating short videos on public WhatsApp groups, such as Kawaii and TikTok. Here, my background, academic background, I have a bachelor in sociology, then a degree in social science, a master in political soci sociology by University of Santa Catarina, followed by a PhD candidate in the program for democracy in the 21st century. And I work on Global South, WhatsApp group, Messengers Communications. Latest publications, I work on digital sociology, digital activism, and I work on ethical aspects. WhatsApp, enter the WhatsAppers to reinvent the digital activism at the time of chat apps. I also have a review regarding a project that I took place back in 2017. That is a WhatsAppers, the community school in Portugal and Spain. And a policy briefing communication conducted by the ECHO Institute and Democratic Deliberation and under representative groups and WhatsApp communication during pandemics. Chat apps, the game changers of the 20s, 20s. The, but in 2018, we had the internet minute. Then 2019, this is what happens, and we have an exponential increase. So our academy, we as an academic, we follow that scenario. WhatsApp or Telegram or Facebook Messenger or Instant Messenger, you can see here the chart from the year 20s to 2021. I will briefly cover this uh, layer, but WhatsApp uh, that is uh, routinely called Zap Zap, Lifestyle, Brazilian Contacts Matters. We have a population of 214 million, internet presentation 75, approximately 98% of smartphone owners surveyed in Brazil in January said that they had WhatsApp installed on their mobile devices. Brazil has a huge population and a great internet penetration and WhatsApp becomes so strong. We have 41% of the population reported using WhatsApp to share news in 2021. Well, Brazilians, they also see WhatsApp at everyday problem solver. It's a one-stop solution. And also it has that appeal to be a predatory zero rating fees and low, level, and low levels of digital literacy. 
not everyone has a privilege to connect throughout uh, Telegram and has to access obstacles internet in Brazil. And if we have a low tra digital traceability levels, that becomes a promising scenario to propagate the disinformation on a much larger scale, considering different Brazilian regions and how WhatsApp is applied by Brazilian citizens. Why should we care? We have the so-called family groups where they take to uh, public topics are also shared throughout uh, family groups and we also have the co-workers online groups this is a different uh, reasoning from europeans where they just use the family whatsapp group to talk about christmas family celebration, whereas in the global south countries, WhatsApp is used mainly for any sort of communication and not only during Christmas holidays. Here, uh, several political conditions in, in Brazil, such as the Brazilian truckers strike that took place back in 2018 during the months of April and May, and all of that was communicated throughout WhatsApp uh, uh, group of messengers. And also during the last elections, not this year elections, but the 2018 elections, where there was a blog family for one of the candidates that led to the Bolsonaro's um, elections. Uh, Bolsonaro became uh, elected, was nominated as the president during that election, also thanks to those uh, WhatsApp groups. What's the difference between disinformation and misinformation? How do they differ? This information when people intentionally create false or misleading information to make money, have political influence, or to maliciously cause trouble or harm. That's exactly what is taking place via WhatsApp in the Brazilian political system. Magali went deeply into the seven types of misinformation and disinformation, according to Claire Wardos. This is a first draft regarding the main seven differences between the two types of lack of information by misinformation or disinformation. É, a, a publicação que eu praticamente apresentei na Escola de Verão de Bonn estava mais ligada a um capítulo. É da uh, Bonn's Academy. I had the chance to share the dark side of WhatsAppers. And during this presentation, we were reflecting upon the construction of a daily policies that there is that intimate blurring between the public and the private boundaries. How could that become not just a global phenomenon, but also a local phenomenon? And the importance of inact familiar relationships where interpersonal trust of information is shared by different WhatsAppers groups, and that WhatsApp shots of disinformation or misinformation to foster a pro-Bolsonaro environment on WhatsApp during 2018 elections. So in the disinformation on WhatsApp chapter, we deal uh, as, uh, a strat as a tool, a strategic tool to defeat the political opponent. WhatsApp is likely to be weaponized mainly in the private and public WhatsApp groups where this information uh, travels so fast and you are not able to correct it, neither to uh, perform a fact checking. And how can we set a link between those more conservative WhatsApp repertoire and simultaneously to the advance of the Bolsonaro digital campaign and WhatsApp? 
uh, with the rise of a Bolsonarismo in Brazil, which is a terminology used to exemplify the Bolsonaro digital uh, electoral campaign. 2018 elections, WhatsApp as a game changer. That would be a way to perform political campaigns in a different WhatsApp group. Here I have changed two different images which became viral in 2018, which was the Mamadeira de Piroca that was named by the Brazilian public, as well as the Kit Gay that uh, became uh, fully disseminated. Uh, that was the baby bottle with a penny shaped on WhatsApp groups and target Fernando Haddad of attempting to implement the gay kit through an uh, educational program to promote gender ideology in Brazilian elementary schools. That's very typical to our electoral campaign. And that was, it became a viral throughout public and private WhatsApp group messengers. And that became a turning point to change the political strategy to elect Bolsonaro as a pres president. 2022 elections, this information through short videos. What are they gonna change for, next, for this year? especially election and electronic uh, uh, vote uh, areas, especially during the work for the, te the labor force, they are now creating a different scenario where they were attacking the court and the prosecutors and promoters offices in uh, over TikTok, they do not believe upon the conducted researches because the Brazilians, they wanted to detour from voting to Bolsonaro or the other president Lula. There was a dissertation during the 2022 20, elections, pro-Bolsonaro group circulating fake videos that showed suspicious electronic voting machines to create the narrative that the elections would be a floss. So well, how about the methodology? The data collection was done by mapping around 15,000 public WhatsApp groups that was conducted by, by power.com.br during the months of September and November. The WhatsApp monitor called Power collected content from 15,000 public WhatsApp groups and some reports were driven and issued not only to the court, but also to some media vehicles where data selections was conducted and special reports, they were conducted every two days regarding some specific aspects during elections, the first or the second round, and how would that change the ballot box? A number of shared videos to analyze how the sharing of this information plays as a strategic to, uh, action to disseminate short videos on WhatsApp public groups in an era in which videos are increasingly shared on chat apps with less effort and lower costs, thanks to zero rating fees. And the goal is to research on what happens during the elections in the court. I have to be fast. I have to close this presentation. Some public groups where that information was shared, especially under Bolsonaro groups, the same uh, that happened in 2018 took a place right now. They are much more active throughout the networks and more strategics, not only as to the algorithms, but also in uh, sharing private messages, not only via WhatsApp, but also via Telegram. And what I can say is that in the post-election period, all this narrative that was created deepened, particularly with the occupation of um, the army headquarters and what they were saying that people should not trust the election. So it came from the pre-electoral period. 
it got worse between the first and the second round, and it continued with all these uh, measures that were taken. But I haven't collected more data, but we still see reports from the Research Institute, and they continue orchestrating uh, initiatives. And what I could say is that the strategy changes since uh, platforms such as Kawaii and TikTok were not even used in 2018. And they brought suspicion to the electoral system, particularly with attack to the justices and attacks against the Workers' Party, the PT, but in a different perspective because they were trying to attack the elections. And I believe these human structure um, content still continues to be shared in public groups such as WhatsApp all over Brazil. And I believe that shots of disinformation on WhatsApp was further aggravated in 2022. And they had a campaign, they had a strategy to share this digital content that emotionally and strategically was supported by the Bolsonaro groups. They create this parallel reality to what is happening. And Lula had to win not only against his opponent, but also this avalanche of misinformation, of disinformation and the state apparatus. And this is why it's uh, Bolsonaro had a fantastic number of votes in these elections. And as a sociologist, what I could recommend, things that we should think about for the coming four years, Lula has to invest heavily in a digital cabinet so as to come up with different ways to work in the systems and this scenario, 214 million Brazilians, we must think about ways to bring this into society. And like José said, and gave suggestions, we must think about digital literacy so that the average Brazilian can also understand how disinformation through WhatsApp happens. So it ends up that we sometimes publish that, publish content, but this topic is really not very well treated for the average Brazilian. So we must think about how to fight disinformation and how to move this theme from the academia to society as a whole. So average citizens are better informed. And I have an extension project in Portugal that's what I did through when I did my PhD to deal with digital literacy with Portuguese youngsters, such as instant messaging and telegram, and how we can think about creating a long-term educational program. If we start now, perhaps in 30 years, we will have a better chance that democracies all over the world will survive. So we have to think about reforming these platforms, but also over the long term in terms of an educational campaign. Since I am a sociologist, I believe that if we combine this top-down initiatives from the parliament with bottom-up pedagogical measures, we will somehow be able to safeguard democracies in the future. And we see that in 2022, no campaign in this respect was done. And even thinking about re-election that failed for, um, by the incumbent president, Jair Bolsonaro. As a sociologist, I believe this is ultra important and I believe we should invest over the next four years in Brazil. I'm trying this format in Portugal, but I intend to apply this um, program in Brazil. So here I end my presentation. I, I was in this German Institute for some time 
and I investigated how to do a qualitative research into WhatsApp and with ele the elections, I had a different experience and next year I will be connected to this Austrian Institute, Digital Humanism. It's the Institute for Human Science where I'll be a Digital Humanism Fellow and I will deal with this election data and also thinking about the interviews that I'm compiling in Brazil as a pro progressist and activist uh, in Brazil against this disinformation campaign wrought by the Bolsonaro groups. Thank you very much. I am at your disposal. And in the future, Magali, if you want to think about a on-site event, I'll be available. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sergio. We'll now move on to questions. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all the researchers here in this hybrid conference, particularly Brita, who's here by my side. So a question to Magali. Magali. Cristina asked you a question. Are there open source research tools designed not to record your data, duck the go, that are not accepted by the major public? So what do you think we would need to conquer uh, users, what would we need to make it go viral, website or news? Well, this is the $1 million question by Christina, because what to do to make a video viral? If I knew it, I would be a millionaire now. So, Christine, when we, you talk about open code, this is the best of the world. We know that, but we also know that even the activists of free software, such as Sergio Amadeo, they're also in the major platforms and proprietary networks, because this is where everybody is. For example, I love Linux, but people are not there. Not everybody is in Linux, not the majority. So it's a matter that these large networks will embrace everything. Now we see people leaving Twitter because of the acquisition by Elon Musk, and people are going to Mastodon, but it's also free software and it's harder, so people give up. So it's difficult to join, it's more complicated because they have improved the code. We must be resilient and insist to join Mastodon. Also, not to have just the option of the other one. Cool. And I believe it's right wing. So, Christina, it's hard, but we must insist on open source software because it's a good way out. And I'd like to take this opportunity and thank you for your questions. A few people are asking me for the PowerPoint presentation. I will send it to you. And I'd like to thank you for your presentations. Brita, who knows how to get people together to talk about such a dear topic. And it's everybody, Sergio, for instance, now with the issue of these video pills, they are very attractive, so much so that Viney is coming back. It was one of the very first before Snapchat and before um, TikTok, so Viney used to be an application for six second videos, very short videos, and it's great that it's coming back. So, thank you for the questions. I know there was a question about how to do research on YouTube. I think it's the same way we do uh, in everything, going into the API, working with the hashtags, with the keywords, so that we can um, 
get to an answer on how to get to a few things that we see on YouTube. And like Tanya asked about depression on YouTube, it's the same way that we do research in other platforms. And if you would like to research on you on Twitter, you have to rush before the new owner closes the API and we can no longer research in Twitter. If you would allow me, I would like to ask a question to Sergio. Sergio, take into account that nowadays, journalists, those who already got a degree or are about to, they are learning a bit more about data and fast checking fact checking while a student at the university fact checking was not available i like uh, if you elaborate a little bit more about uh, fake news and a news setup what is the role of journalists uh, in that role thank you so much for your question very timely this is a topic that has to be addressed throughout fact checking. I believe that we should rely on more interdisciplinary teams. While in Bonn, we would work with some journalists and they would share videos that would be beneficial and effective to help us to faster diagnose a case of disinformation. Journalists, they were very helpful and supportive in that case. And in a way, we would be able to check the fact if that would be a case of disinformation or not. However, there is a different timing, checking time, and we should elaborate a bit more for the future. How could we match actions between civil society, parliaments, uh, journalists, politicians, and institutions if we are all aligned? even better, and we reach the conclusion that to be able to remove something from the platforms once that has been identified, not only by journalists, but also by researchers, it's a bit too late because that information has already been navigated throughout WhatsApp and we didn't remove that in time. And we have to improve our actions to be more effective. Otherwise, we are going to have a large volume of this information and next candidates they will have to surpass that turmoil of information. So I guess that we do need to raise awareness. Citizens, they have to be aware about digital inclusion to be able to get information, share it, and somehow find the easier ways to verify and check it out if that is a real and true information or not. And how can journalists, you know, play uh, play that link between the two sides and we should go even beyond that uh, fact uh, checking agencies if digital literacy becomes a curriculum component as part of a personal uh, background in chemistry, mathematics, and others, we are going to have citizens who will be aware of their duties and obligations and better informed to live in our society. Therefore, such a timing between removing some information from algorithmic platforms and to travel that information throughout to the WhatsApp group of messengers and other messenger groups that has to be aligned to the civil society and democratic institutions. Journalists, they could 
be more related to that and a more massive campaign should be conducted, especially take into account inequalities in the Brazilian scenario and how can we improve and take that step by step, including democratic institutions. We had reached some improvements and some achievements, but we still have a long way to go. Magali has mentioned platforms that keep changing, such as TikTok, uh, short videos, and those uh, comprehensive videos that talk to Brazilians that have a digital literacy, or maybe that have a chance to see a video and they share that to other WhatsApp group messengers. So we better find a way to better deceive uh, this information and how uh, journalists play a very important role in that uh, communication and they were, you know, but targeted during the Bolsonarism and activism. And so it's high time that we uh, perform a long term campaign for the next four years with less disinformation for 2026. Oi, muito obrigada, Sergio. Thank you very much, Sergio. And owing to the time, we're closing now. And I'd like to invite Eugênio to utter his final remarks. Gente, eu, eu fiquei fascinado com esse seminário. I was Sergio, muito obrigado pela seminar. menção que você fez, Sergio, a minha participação lá. Eu fico realizado como professor. And I é, feel really quero cumprimentar very glad a, a Magali, I'd like a Patrícia, o professor Magali, Patricia, Arimonsky. Um, é, professor eu gostei I, muito I really enjoyed da, da apresentação Eu estou aqui tomando notas. Deixa eu voltar aqui nas minhas Let notas. Go back I took notes of that you da apresentação said. de todos vocês, I mas really do Zé Renato também, que, que, que já saiu, José Renato, é, que ele tinha um problema de agenda. Foi um seminário riquíssimo, riquíssimo. Me, me trouxe muita novidade. Olha o que a gente está acompanhando me, Eu acho que é um luxo incrível. Olha, nós estamos numa universidade pública, e a universidade pública não tem luxo, não tem regalia, não tem privilégio. Nós trabalhamos sempre com a noção de Direito. Mas, mesmo assim, é um luxo contar com a presença da Brita Partner, é uma coisa é, foi riquíssima também, o que você nos trouxe. É, o Daniel Schroeder, essa questão de previsão do ciclo das, das conspirações, que coisa notável. Eu estou maravilhado em que, como vocês podem perceber, really é, pela, pelas apresentações de hoje, ainda bem que isso vai ficar gravado. E quero fazer, por fim, uma... Recorded, and lastly, é, um I'd dueto like muito rápido do é, a very quick duet. É, um dueto é meio sing together, assim. Well, isso que eu quero dizer. Singing é, together. Eu gostaria That's what de, I mean. É, em relação ao que a Magali contou Regarding das fake what agências Magali de checagem, about que coisa, fake fact-checking agencies, que eu tenho olhando I'd like to express what I feel looking at certain recent que eles criaram, um, events in countries such as Russia. They've come up with é, new categories, which news are rooms. Quero fake dizer, news rooms, não as fake that news. Is, mas Not fake, fake news, news anymore, but fake news rooms. Falsas. Redações jornalísticas so, news que não são rooms, jornalísticas, que são é, propagandísticas, que, journalistic, que but they não feed on propaganda and they do é, not comply with any of the methodological and epistemological protocols of journalism and uh, therefore é, create a fictitious is reality. These are things for us to pay attention. Vocês, and I'd like to greet you and vocês, congratulate é, you. Thank you so much for your participation, e, particularly e Brita. 
a Patrícia, ao professor Eric Blonsky, com, tem, com quem tem sido uma grande honra trabalhar. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado. Professor Ari, would you like to say anything? Yes. First of all, I'd like to reiterate the thanks to Magali, who captured this idea in the air and organized this seminar, which was really excellent, an international seminar, not only because of British presence, but also the other participants, Oslo, and other places. And I thank Patricia for being the moderation. I hope to Sergio and Magali that they recover as soon as possible. And I'd like to leave you with an issue, but well, it's mostly a reflection or a thought. One of the presentations, I think it was the second presentation, mentioned that these cycles of fake news last for a limited period of time. And here, the last presentation by Sergio, obviously, talks about the analysis of electoral cycles and is concerned about the next cycle in four years' time. So what I'd really like to bring you as an issue is perhaps because, like McEwen said, that the middle is the message and the means of communications, TikTok, and these are very short-lived uh, cycle media. So the focus has been on the media and therefore the cycle is short. So I just like to leave you with this thought on the, the message. So disinformation, misinformation, you can call it whatever uh, you want. These are secular messages. Exactly one century ago, a situation was revealed that had been created 20 years before 1902, 1903, by the Russian secret police under the Tsar, Ohana, which is the secret police that wrote down the Zion protocols. And these were 24 reports of 24 meetings that took place in Basel behind the curtains of what was the first Zionist conference. So, in synthesis, these protocols supposedly indicated a Machiavellic plan to control the world by manipulating the economy, the media, and the promotion of the religious conflict between countries. So this protocol after the 1917 revolution spread throughout those who survived the, the Bolshevist regime. And it served, it very well served the Nazi regime that published 20-some editions of these protocols, and it had a huge repercussion because perhaps the main businessman at the time, Henry Ford, who also owned a newspaper, 
and he published articles based on the book, taking the book as truthful. And 100 years ago, this was shown to be a plagiarism of a another text that had been written decades before in France dial, dialogues in hell between Machiavel and Montesquieu, whatever it is, the reason is that these protocols of the elders of Zion are here until today, not only through pirate editions in countries that forbid their publication, but in ideas. For instance, every idea, every campaign that is done in the person of George Soros, a major investor in the financial markets, who has an, an NGO named Open Society. So the analysis model that we heard today is focused on the media and a short cycle. My reflection, and it's not a question, it doesn't require an answer, but I think it's uh, for us to think about these longer cycles, century-old cycles, or century-lasting cycles, messages that have penetrated our culture, grew roots, just like certain diseases such as tuberculosis, and we hope that it's not the same as as polio. It seems like they've disappeared, but they reemerge in other forms. So I hear and my remark. I'd like to thank you for your presentations and I hope that we have a world that is less polluted in terms of communication and information and ideas than what we see at present. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Só estou ligando meu som aqui para aplaudir as palavras do nosso so grande líder I, Ari Guilherme Eriksson. We are applauding the words of our leader Ari Plonsky. Very well. So, Brita, if you would like to say something, just want a little words. Thank you so much, uh, Patricia, also for moderating. I think um, I really like the sum, um, um, summary uh, given by Professor uh, Butzi, and uh, I think there is nothing else to say. Uh, so I thank everybody. I, it was so great for me to see you all again, and I really feel that uh, those people we collected, we brought together in Bonn, uh, makes a very rich uh, community, and I, my wish would be that uh, there will be further interaction and spreading like that, like this. So um, thank you all for being here and contributing and hope to see you again in person soon. Bye. <laughs> so we hereby close this event. Thank you very much, everybody. So I hope you recover from your health problems and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Magali, Sergio, Brita. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Sergio, Georgia, Claudia.